So our next speaker is Lorraine Bigrig. Lorraine is the co-owner of Studio TKM Associates Incorporated, along with her partner, Deborah LaCamera. Their private practice is devoted to the conservation of works on paper, including fine art and historic works, Asian paintings, prints, cartographic materials and globes, as well as decorative arts for institutional and private clients in North America, Europe, and Asia. Prior to this, Lorraine was senior conservator at Studio TKM, having worked with TK for 29 years until his retirement last year. Lorraine received her Master in Art Conservation from Queen's University and is a professional associate at AIC. And when her talk is about the globes upstairs. <laughs> Good afternoon. Um, this talk is just revisiting the treatment of the Mulby Globes that are here at the Marriott Library. Um, um, and before I begin, I want to say, wow, those are two enormous um, projects, paper projects, and uh, I'm honored to be following them. Um, and before, before I actually begin the talk, I want to clarify that a version of this talk was given two years ago at AIC in Miami and was prepared um, by both myself and Deborah La Camera and TK as well at that time. And I was encouraged by colleagues to present it again here at the Marriott Library for the benefit of all the WAC attendees um, who are able to see the globes in their grand splendor in situ as well as for the staff and faculty at the university to have a better understanding of the complexity of the conservation treatment. Um, and so I began and you see that um, this slide has the Studio TKM logo um, because the, the project actually was carried out um, when the studio um, was still under the direction of TK. Historic globes are fragile objects, casualties of curious viewers and probing fingers, and few survive without damage to the varied materials used in their fabrication, whether it's structural damage, discoloration of the varnish, or loss of paper and design media. Orchestrating the multidisciplinary conservation of globes has become the responsibility of the paper conservator. Globe treatments are extremely involved with many small steps leading to a successful outcome. In fact, the treatment of this pair of 36-inch Malby globes took nearly 1,400 studio hours. So what I hope to do with this short presentation is to highlight the aspects of globe conservation that demonstrate where we are in studio practice, touching on our philosophical approach to the treatment of globes, highlighting its multidisciplinary nature and a few particular techniques that have been developed over the last 20 years. For those of you with a particular interest in globe conservation, a full publication of the treatment is featured in the 2015 issue of the Journal of the Institute of Conservation. This 36-inch diameter pair of globes was produced between 1845 and 1851 by the British firm Malby and Company. They held great visual appeal, being masterpieces of intaglio printing and hand coloring. They were equally well regarded as scientific and instructional instruments. The cartography documents the coastlines and interiors of even remote continents with unprecedented accuracy. This pair is of particular interest because of its unusual provenance. While in England in 1851, the president of the Church of Latter-day Saints British Mission purchased these globes for the newly established University of Deseret. They were transported from England by ship and then by the arduous overland wagon trail to the Utah Territory. And if you look closely, you'll see it's a little Photoshop magic in the, uh, in the covered wagon. We put a little globe in there. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't resist. This prayer projected both the ideals of education and the worldliness of the university founders. The current University of Utah president, at least I think he's still the university president, David Pershing, describes the Globes as remarkable examples of a passion for education and discovery and of an unwavering belief in education that the Utah pioneers possessed as they struggled to build a society in the West. I can't even imagine. It is typical for a pair of Globes to be almost identical in construction, but they often differ in both condition and appearance. The objectives for this treatment were to stabilize the structure of the globes and improve their legibility while achieving a coordinated appearance. 
by clearly presenting the outcomes associated with the different treatment options and how each would affect the duration and cost of the treatment, we were able to wed the desires and budget of the GLOBE's custodians with our vision for a well-considered conservation practice based on connoisseurship and craftsmanship. The Malby Globes reflect the general methods of globe fabrication that were developed in the early 16th century and persisted through the 19th century. A hole in the celestial globe enabled us to view its internal construction that you see on the screen. The two hemispheres were molded over a form, over a form from multiple layers of paper. They were connected with a post between the poles and joined with adhesive at the equator. The sphere was then coated with a uniform thickness of plaster and covered with printed gores. In this case, the gores were entirely printed using black ink on laid paper. In order to make an assemb the assembly a bit easier on a sphere of this scale, each of the gores was divided into three sections and collots were used to cover the poles. This slide of the gores um, <coughs> pinned onto our photo wall in the studio gives you a sense of the size and division of these gores. In total, 80 pieces of paper were used to cover the sphere. Once adhered in place, this paper veneer was burnished, sized, and hand-colored with transparent watercolor. A natural resin varnish protected the surface from handling and the deposition of grime. And I, I like this photo because it, it sort of kept things very organized in the studio, and this is the way we worked once we started to reassemble it. On both the celestial and terrestrial spheres, the varnish was discolored and very brittle with cracks and extensive abrasion and chipping. Both spheres exhibited cracks and losses in the shell, which translated into many tears, losses, and abrasions in the covering paper and design. Beneath the varnish, it was apparent that the hand coloring remained bright and the cream-colored paper remained quite clean. The terrestrial globe exhibited marked damage to the structure including an almost complete split around the equator, causing the two hemispheres to be misaligned. The underlying layer of paper mache was revealed and the plaster was fractured with many pieces lost. The extent of loss and the degree of misregistration was partially concealed by layers of putty and overpaint. On the celestial globe, there were several isolated losses, the most pronounced of which were actual holes through the paper mache and plaster. The major difference in approach between the treatments of the two spheres was that the terrestrial globe required disassembly of the sphere and full structural stabilization, which necessitated complete removal of the gores, while the areas of damage on the celestial globe were isolated so that the removal of a few individual gore sections was sufficient to allow access to address the damage to the underlying sphere structure. The treatment began with the mechanical removal of the brittle varnish layer by scratching over the surface with a scalpel. This technique was possible because of both the degraded nature of the aged coating and the very smooth surface of the sphere. The process is more time consuming but exceptionally clean compared to solvent removal. There is no deposition or absorption of the solubilized varnish or residual surface grime into the underlying paper. However, solvents are often necessary if the varnish layer is embedded in the paper or the surface is sufficiently textured that mechanical removal would risk abrasion of the media. This photo shows solvents being used to remove this discolored varnish from an early 20th century um, AK Johnston globe. Overpaint removal of, on the Malby terrestrial was carried out in collaboration with paintings conservator Gianfranco Pocobene to determine a solvent system. This required a battery of solvents including ethanol, acetone, and xylene. The removal exposed the salvageable areas of original design, but also revealed extensive paper losses. Losses like this commonly occur where the sphere rubs against the horizon ring as it rotates in the stand. The paper gores were, were removed from the entire surface of the terrestrial globe and from areas around isolated losses in the celestial globe using a handheld steamer to enable us to address the damage to the spheres and also the attendant tears and losses in the gores themselves. Once bare, the terrestrial sphere was then humidified in a makeshift polyethylene um, 
tent with, uh, and humidified with an ultrasonic humidif humidifier um, and, hum and until sufficiently pliable to manipulate the two hemispheres back into registration. The break at the equator was repaired with Jade 403 and allowed to dry under constraint using multiple straps of cotton twill tape. The gaps, small losses, and cracks were filled with plaster and sanded smooth. Holes in the celestial globe were filled by adhering a preliminary foundation of four-ply mat board to the interior of the sphere, adding layers of paper mache using wheat starch paste, and leveling the surface using the same plaster. Following these repairs, the surfaces were covered with Japanese kozo paper using wheat starch paste, allowed to dry, and then sized with wheat starch paste again. After drying, the surface was burnished with the Japanese glass beads used for scroll mounting. They are ideal for accommodating the curvature of the sphere. The Japanese paper was applied to protect the plaster and repairs, while the sizing, burnishing, and pencil notations facilitated positioning of the gores during remounting. I think that's my favorite point of the treatment is when the globe's been structurally um, secured and it has the Japanese paper layer on it. I think it's very beautiful. As each gore was removed, it was cleaned and lined immediately. Working over a template of the gore shape drawn on mylar allowed us to keep the fragmented gores in registration. The gores of these particular globes did not require much additional cleaning except in areas where the varnish had become compromised. However, this is not usually the case. Cleaning is often a large part of improving the legibility of globe design. So we have been testing various gel systems and solutions, including pH and conductivity adjusted solutions, as well as chelators and citrates um, in xanthan gum and pemulin. Though we have found the results to vary greatly, um, we continue to find that methyl cellulose, when used as a surfactant, generally releases grime while imparting a desirable surface coating. We generally fill losses with pulp or paper tone to match the surrounding paper, as shown in the repair of the Senex globe. Design features on fill material can be introduced gradually. For example, lines of latitude and longitude are relatively straightforward to complete. However, we have found that when design elements and lettering are done by hand, even when based on photographs of an identical globe, they rarely duplicate the graphic quality of printing and therefore generally detract from the appearance. Digital imaging techniques allow for clean and accurate reproduction of missing areas when source material is available. Impressions of unmounted gore sheets were historically bound like an atlas for reference and one with celestial lore, gores of this Malby globe was available for scanning in the collection of the Royal Geographic Society in London. The three major advantages to scanning are a one-to-one -one scale, a nice black line image without color, and an image generally free from wear or damage. The more common source for reproduction is another globe, as, with the, as was the case with the Malby terrestrial globe. And you can see from this one example of a select area um, of the equator how much additional image manipulation is required to isolate the original intaglio lines. When working from a color photograph taken from an age globe, color and signs of wear and tear have to be removed, and the image needs adjustment to achieve dimensional accuracy of the original flat sheet. In 2007, when this treatment was carried out, we used commercial pigmented inkjet printing on handmade paper. Printing was carried out at Singer Productions in Boston. The commercial pigmented inks provided suitable light, moisture, solvent, and handling stability. However, the tone and density of the inkjet lines vary substantially from intaglio printed ink lines. And as a result, it required quite a bit of finessing of the contrasting colors in order to simulate the original. And you can see the large fill um, in the slide on your, on your left. We have experimented with laser printing, which much better s simulates the fineness and three-dimensionality of an intaglio line. However, the thermostatic medium will not withstand the heavy burnishing that is required in the final steps of treatment. The ink can smudge as it heats up under the pressure of the glass beads or the bone folder. 
As an update, we now use lithographic polyester plate printing to generate fills, a, te a technique that we were introduced to by Stephanie Lucier and Scott Homolka in their modern printmaking course. And to create a polyester uh, plate print, the digital image is flipped horizontally, printed directly onto a commercial polyester sheet, such as a pronto plate, with either a laser printer or a photocopier. And this is a photo of master printer Caroline Muscat um, that pulls our impressions for us. The toner acts as a, as a grease and the polymer plate can then be inked up with a brayer, um, just as a traditional lithographic stone would be. And the plate yields the same range of tone and values as a lithographic stone or a metal plate would, um, although you, can only, you get many fewer um, impressions before the image starts to break down. Um, this technique is quick, inexpensive, and very stable, and we are using traditional printer's ink, handmade in small batches from carbon black pigments in linseed oil. The one caveat to this process is that once inked, the pronto plate cannot be wiped to modulate the quantity of ink on the plate surface, as one would with an intaglio plate. But to get back to the Mulby Globes, um, here we see Deborah working on a light box over a Mylar template. Um, the fills were inserted with wheat starch paste and reinforced with Japanese paper. Um, with the fills complete, there were many small steps taken to ensure successful remounting of the gores. For example, the lining papers were trimmed, chamfered, and selectively toned. The gores were burnished, pre-pasted with wheat starch paste and allowed to dry, and mounting paste was pre prepared using methyl cellulose as a gelling agent. Once mounted and dry, the entire surface of the globe was burnished and then sized with a 3% solution of gelatin using an airbrush rather than brushing to avoid disrupting the adhesion of the gores. Sizing acts as an isolation layer for toning of the original gores and is essential to prevent darkening of the paper when varnished. As you see here, one consequence of the process of the local treatment of the celestial globe was the slight difference was slight differential cleaning. Paper extract was used um, to tone these lighter areas to match the gores that were not removed. We prefer paper extract known as the colloquial term, Japanese term, susu, for its sympathetic color and reversibility. Unlike a pigment, susu does not lodge into the paper fibers. And that being said, additional watercolor, pastel, or graphite are sometimes required as well. A natural or synthetic resin varnish is generally applied to saturate the design, develop an approximate, appropriate impression of depth and sheen, and offer some protection from dust and handling. We rely on the research in other disciplines for the development of coatings that are stable, historically accurate in appearance, and suitable for specific applications. The resins that we find most suitable for historic globe coatings include Gambar, B72 for very thin coatings, and Demar containing tinubin, which was selected for use on these Malby globes. A base layer was applied with an airbrush to limit the absorption into the paper, followed by brush applications. In summary, there were multiple options for the procedures and materials used to conserve the Malby globe spheres. A different combination of choices could have yielded similar outcomes, but nevertheless, the treatment as carried out was successful in rendering the pair comparable in appearance as if they had been well cared for over their lifetime. And because of the limited time, um, I can only show you a few quick slides to demonstrate the results of the multidisciplinary effort directed at this treatment. The globe stands were conserved by John Brandon at East Point Conservation. John cleaned, stabilized, and beautifully restored the damaged furniture. Contemporary globe maker James Bissell Thomas at the firm of Graves and Thomas in London cast, engraved, and machined the missing brass meridian and hour rings. Orologist Richard Ketchen milled the compass cases and magnetized needles, and the final results were pretty spectacular. Here you see the celestial globe installed in the newly renovated University of Utah in its display case custom designed and built by small core. In conclusion, while the conservation of historic globes involves elements of objects, furniture, and paintings conservation, it has become a specialty within paper conservation. 
It depends on the same building blocks of connoisseurship that distinguishes all areas of expertise. A familiarity with the appearance of well-preserved globes, accurate identification of compromises in condition, the ability to prioritize treatment and anticipate changes, familiarity with the other areas of material specialty, and a body of treatment expertise that promotes technical imagination and finesse of execution. We thank all those whose expertise we drew upon in the execution of this treatment, particularly Randy Silverman, preservation librarian, whom you all know, and also, of course, T.K. McClintock, whose connoisseurship and expertise in globe conservation guided this marvelous and exceptional treatment. And finally, I would like to give a special thanks, thanks to my longstanding co-worker and now business partner, Deborah LaCamera. Thank you. Thanks, Lorraine. Does anyone have any questions? I think back there. It's obvious these were a mess and that <laughs> your result was spectacular. Thank you. But uh, was there a study done or were there considerations taken for any testimonial scrapes, bangs, and, and uh, conditions that were due to its trip from uh, uh, England to uh, the wild, wild west of Pioneer Salt Lake City? Um, I and if there were, did you think about preserving those or keeping them as evidence of its history? I think their, um, the amount of wear and tear that they had undergone um, in the time since they first traveled here um, was much obscured, and there would be no way of knowing um, what had happened en route. Um, but we did document the, um, the condition of them fully, you know, prior to any treatment that was begun. So, um, so to answer, no, we did not. <laughs> what did you use to support the globes during treatment? I saw some kind of a structure on casters. Yeah, we actually have these wonderful um, rolly um, dollies um, that, are carpet, that are carpet covered. And um, we often use sono tubes that we line with um, Tyvek, padded Tyvek. Um, and then I believe that, was it green? There's a green corrugated, um, I don't know if it was some kind of barrel bought probably at Home Depot. We're giving a lot of endorsements for Home Depot today. Um, and then that was quite often with that one, we just line it with belts. And it's close to the floor, it's heavy, it's easy to manipulate. And then in the, at the end of the day, they're covered with holotex and a belt over top. Um, and they just get rolled back in storage. Thank you, Lorraine. I think 